Hey, good morning. Um, welcome to our third episode of Ohio Rock Talks. Um, I can't believe we're already halfway, but it's been a super fun series so far. I hope you guys agree. Um, and we have another awesome presentation today on um, ancient land fossils, ancient land um, plants and animals from around Ohio that uh, we're going to have our, our geologists from the Ohio Geological Survey um, talk about. So I have with me Tyler Norris. And, there you go, Tyler, and um, also Chris Wright. So Tyler's going to kick it off here in a few, but I just kind of wanted to, you know, recap what we've already talked about and what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. So, you know, the first week we talked about fossil basics, pretty much like everything fossils. And then last week was super cool. We talked about the unseen oceans around Ohio and the ancient marine fossils that you can that you can find. So this week we're on to plants and animals. Um, found on land, like I mentioned, and next week I'm excited uh, to talk about Ohio's Ice Age and we'll answer questions about, um, you know, were there saber-toothed tigers in Ohio uh, around that time and why did mammoths go extinct and this was a time when essentially the state was one big giant ice skating rink. Um, and then finally, the last week we're going to talk about um, how to fossil hunt in Ohio. You know, where can you legally get fossils in Ohio? Where's the best places to go look for them? And what can you expect to find? Um, so each week when we've been talking about all these different topics, um, I hope that it's inspired some of you to get out and go find your own fossils. Um, that's really what we're, what we're doing this for. And I know one of our viewers, Rose, has uh, shared some pictures of several fossils that she's found since we've started this series, which is super awesome. And I hope you're with us um, today, Rose. Uh, and I just want to point everybody out to the Q&A box. So feel free to ask questions throughout. Don't be shy. If you just want to say hi and let us know where you're from, we like knowing, uh, we like, you know, hearing that too. Um, so I'm Alyssa Gaple. And you may have seen me here before. I'll be with you again next week. Um, and as I said, I have uh, Tyler Norris and Chris Wright with me today. So I'm going to pass it off to um, to Tyler now to start his um, presentation. And yeah, use your Q&A box. <laughs> Great. So thank you, Alyssa. So as you said, my name is Tyler Norris, and I'm a mapping geologist that typically focuses on investigating the Ice Age and glacial geology in Ohio. But I grew up and I did my early studies in the Appalachian Mountains, actually, where coal and these land-based fossils and rocks were common and part of my life and my landscape. So I'll pull up a slideshow here and share it with you and show you about some of the rocks that we find during this time period. So, can everybody see it? It's loading. There we go. Great. So, we'll be discussing rocks such as the one we see on the right here. You may think it is a fossil, but of what? It kind of looks like tire tracks, kind of looks like snake skin, but stay tuned and find out. But before we can understand the rocks of Ohio, we have to first understand the time periods we're talking about. So you may recognize this image from last week's Rock Talk, and this is what's known as a geologic time scale. And one way that geologists need to describe, describe rocks is by organizing them into time zones when they were made or deposited. Since rocks can be very old, it can be tough to differentiate between all these different types of rocks. So time is first divided into large chunks of time known as eons, and that is in this artist's rendition picture here on the left. On the bottom, we have the Archean Proterozoic, which are example of eons, which were billions of years ago. And then time is broken up further into eras, like we see here on the left, the Met, Paleo, Meso, and Cenozoic, meaning old, middle, and newer life. And these mark major changes in animals and plants and in the climate and landscape. And then we also have finer groups called periods. And these periods are like the Ordovician, Silurian, and Devonian periods where sea life was plentiful, and that was a time that we talked about in the last Rock Talk on Ohio's ancient seas. But today we'll be focusing on the next group of time, 
the Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and Permian periods when land life started to dominate Ohio's landscape. So you may wonder about where these names came from, and the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian are pretty intuitive. They come from the states that are nearby us. The Mississippian is named after the Mississippi River Valley to the west, where those rocks are plentiful and when were first uh, studied. And then we have the Pennsylvanian rocks to the east for Pennsylvania, where the Appalachian Mountains are, and that's where those rocks were majorly studied and are best described. And then we have Permian, which is Perm, which is a little bit of an outlier. That is actually in Russia, so it's, that studies the, uh, the, where the mountains are of this age. But because in some parts of the Earth, Mississippian and Pennsylvanian are very similar, we group them into one name called the Carboniferous. So you may wonder where this Carboniferous name comes from, but stay tuned to find that out as well. So next, we should look, about, look at Ohio's bedrock geology as a whole. So this is a map that some of you may be familiar with. This is Ohio's geologic map. So this is, shows all the rocks that you would find on the surface if you just stripped away the soils and other surface material. And these rocks are divided using the time scale units that I just talked about and showed you before on the left. And some of these rocks are covered with glacial soils and debris left behind by the glaciers, often a material called till. So in Ohio, we can't always see the bedrock. And that's denoted by this line here. The area pre predominantly covered with this glacial debris is outlined north by this glacial margin, indicating the maximum position of the last glaciers. But today, we'll be talking about the Pennsylvanian, Mississippi, and Permian, which are these light blue, gray, brown colored rocks. And they make up almost half the state's geology, especially in the areas where the glaciers did not uh, occupy. But you might also notice on the map there's this bent line A to A prime that takes up throughout half the state and that's what's known as a cross section which is seen down here because it goes across the state and that's and you get a little section of it. So just imagine cutting through all of the layers of rocks almost like pieces of cake and all these different layers of rocks or layers and if you pull that piece of cake up, this is what you might expect to find along that line. And they're just multicolored, so you can kind of they'll tell the difference between the time period names. So the time period we're concerned about is the Mississippi and Pennsylvania Permian, which is in this section here, and is also known as the Appalachian Basin. And that's related to the Appalachian Mountains, which we'll talk about soon. But first, let's talk about what Ohio looked like during the Carboniferous and Permian time periods, because this is the first time where land and land-based life really took off. So Ohio was periodically covered in deltas, which are these triangular networks of rivers that drain into shallow seas, trailing up from mountains and uplands. An example of what Ohio may have looked like is shown here. This is modern day Ganges River Delta. You can just look it up pretty easily on Google Earth or Google Maps. And this is an area where we have a lot of sand and silt that comes down from the mountains and it's drained very quickly into this shallow sea environment where it picks up sands and silts and it carries them from high elevation to low elevation. And then we also have rivers and floodplains that are associated with these deltas and other areas where they were actually very common when sea levels were a little lower and that made room for water to stream and channel. But an important landscape development in this time period are the swamps. And the swamps developed in the stagnant and wet lowlands, and they had these huge trees that grew in the swamps. And they were a large part of the ecosystem, and they had woody bark and what's known as lignin within their uh, bark. And this is the first time this lignin material, which is a very tough and tough material that's found in trees today, is the first time that it evolved in the fossil record that we know and really took off and it made it really tough for organisms like bugs and bacteria to digest it and break it down so they would need more evolution to kind of take it where they are today but so the, all these plants would die and they'd fall over and pile up and pile up within these swamps and a lot of them were preserved in these nearby swampy environments so if you remember that first snake skin fossil i showed you before you might be surprised that this is actually an impression of these old ancient trees. So if you happen to be fossil hunting in the Pennsylvania 
aged rocks you could find in the snake skin, but there's a good, very good chance that this is actually a piece of this tree known as a lepidodendron. That's shown here, lepidodendron, which means scale tree. Lepid meaning scale and dendron meaning tree. So you can impress your friends with that name. And the bark looked different than trees do today because each of these little dimples here represent where there's a little leaf that came out from the tree and then that leaf would fall off and left this scar imprint. But let's get into how the Ohio seas changed throughout time. So these ancient seas would rise and fall due to glaciations like today. And these rising and falling of sea levels are known as transgression or when water levels would rise, like in this image we have here. So just pay attention to the water level encroaching onto their landscape. And then we have regressing or when the waters would retreat or fall back to a lower elevation like we have here. So this shows how the landscape changed very often between these wet times and these uh, drier times, which happened a lot during the Carboniferous period, especially during the Pennsylvanian. And this happened in many different cycles. But we also have other influences on the water levels, which are important for how rocks and fossils form. So locally, we also had mountains building to the east of Ohio. And this buildup of mountains would cause these little basins that would form on the other flanks of the mountains. So if you can imagine these mountains building by these two pieces of crust that were colliding, and then they'd buckle and they would form these mountains. And then you'd have these little, this little lowland to the other opposite side of the mountain where all the stuff from the mountain would fall off and go down into these basins like a little sink. And that's where these sediments could form and turn into sedimentary rock. So overall, this time was also very tropical and warm and wet because we were actually near the equator. So Ohio was in a different location on the globe than it was today also. And thanks to the large tropical forests like this lepidodendron fossil and other abundant plants and other factors, the oxygen levels were was quite high during this time. In fact, you know, if, if you look at oxygen levels today, it was around 21, it's around 21%, but back then it was 35% of the atmosphere. So that really influenced how these different organisms evolved. So how do we really know that Ohio's landscape had these deltas and swamps? So we know this tropical dynamic environment exists, existed because of the rocks they left behind. And these bits and pieces of the landscape were lithified into rocks. And lithified means they were cemented together, they were recrystallized or even compacted into rocks. And one of these interesting rocks is sandstone during this time. And sandstones are common rocks during times of low, time, low sea levels because that way water is carrying a lot of debris and sand from higher elevations to lower elevations into the sea and eventually into the seas. And these reflect very energetic and high energy environments like next to a beach where you have where waves crashing into a shore. So if you think of sand grains on a beach and then like I said the deltas and the rivers and sometimes pieces of the floodplain from those rivers and even indicates windblown sediment. So if you think of the sand dunes in the desert, those sand grains pile up and can eventually lithify into rock too, and we see that in sandstones as well. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have shale and siltstone that can develop and clay beds as well. And these show where the our environment was perhaps a little quieter and lower energy. So all these small grains of clay and silt could settle out of the water column slowly and lithify into rock. And these are places where you wouldn't expect a lot of strong rivers to be flowing and gushing and carrying pieces of sand, like lakes, some areas near, near rivers, and sometimes old soils. But in, in a lot of cases, they're also found, these are found in seas. So if you think of like when the sea levels were higher and transgressing, these could be an example of when these sea, the water levels are higher and could settle out in the deep ocean to form this rock. Another interesting rock of this time is limestone during the Carboniferous and a bit of the Permian. And these are variable. They can form in different ways and can represent shallow seas when there's algae and sea life that can form these rocks or freshwater bodies. And these are known as carbonates, which Erica talked about last week, which is just a chemical form of mostly carbon dioxide like the air we breathe in the water and sediment and that can eventually form rock. And then lastly, we have coal. So remember those swampy peat bogs where the massive trees and plants piled up? Well, eventually those swamps would get flooded for a long period of time and all that material would get compacted and heated up. 
when sea levels would rise. And this rise in sea level compresses the plants and all these little bits and remains underwater. And that would eventually create this coal and all that carbon and organics turns in this black material. And since coal is made up of a bunch of these tiny bits of plant fossils, it's known as a fossil fuel. But fossils are often unrecognizable inside the coal, except for maybe in small pockets. So if you recall, I said that coal is made up of a lot of carbon. Thus, that is how the Carboniferous period got its name, because this coal was quite common in Ohio's rocks during this time and other parts of the Earth. And that's where we find these thick coal beds. And this stored carbon is a very important resource, and the carbon is released into the air again, like it was during, or when all that material, or the carbon dioxide being saved during the Carboniferous, is released back into the atmosphere when we burn the coal. But the coolest thing about all these different environments is that since all the materials from those environments were preserved, we can find the plants and animals that were preserved in those environments as well. So let's go down through the pieces of the geological time scale that represent this time period. So in the Mississippian, Ohio is a mix of shallow seas, so we have some marine fossils from limestones and such. And then we also have deltas, such as sandstones that are coming, eroding from the mountains to the east. And all of these rocks are outcropping here in this piece of this geological map. We also have a little bit to the northwest from a different type of basin, but a lot of glacial material is covering that up and sometimes it's hard to see that in outcrop. So the weather was warm, tropical and wet, and the deltas from the mountains were depositing water and sediment into the nearby shallow sea and lowland. And with the sea levels rising and falling and the mountains eroding, that created these new environments for land plants to develop and animals. So we have new animals like amphibians emerging in Ohio during this time. So there's animals that like really moist environments. And also insects. So insects are part of a bigger group of animals called arthropods, which are a lot of bugs and spiders and lobster type crustaceans. And a famous example of rocks from this Mississippian time period is known as the Blackhand Sandstone from these deltas and everything eroding off the mountains. And these are famous from the Hawking Hills regions, which is very popular in Ohio. That's found here by the star. But we don't really, they, they don't really have any fossils within the Black Hand, but it's very famous for these unique formations that we see today. And then other, there's other examples such as all along this belt, such as Mohican State Park to the north. So let's look at what the Earth looked like zoomed out from Ohio during this time. The, during the Mississippian, this is known as what's known as a paleogeographic map, so like an old map of the Earth. And continents, you may or may not know, are not always in the same place as they were today, or are today. And they were shaped quite differently with oceans occupying parts of the continent. And the transgression and regression of these seas, when we had less ice, when all that water is being melted from the glaciers or more ice when there's a lot of ice and water trapped into the glaciers developed all this these site were developed in cycles so there's a lot of swampy and coastal wetlands that help these organisms evolve over thousands and millions of years but if you notice the ice wasn't really in ohio because we're actually near the equator so it was really warm and tropical we're south of the equator during the Mississippian time, and then during the late Mississippian time, we're slowly moving northward towards the equator. And then here is another paleogeographic map, and it's a little more complicated than the last one I showed you, but just focus on these big land masses that we have here. This is known as La Russia, which covers North America, some of Europe, and Russia. And then we have Africa. So this is what the app and which is known as the Gondwana plate. So these are big pieces of the chunk where we had other continents such as South America and this plate here, where they're eventually all together and they're trying to form and collide during this Mississippian to Permian time. And this continuous collision caused the rocks to buckle and form that basin in Ohio like I was talking about. And that eventually helped form the Appalachian Mountains. So on the left you can see this the sea where these two continents were colliding and then eventually that sea would close and the, the continents would collide and create more and more of these mountains to rise. 
So you can see Ohio is a little bit smoother. It's a little rougher over here where it says the Alleghenian. So Ohio is like a big bathtub where all the sediment from these mountains were eroding and falling into the bathtub. So next we move into the Pennsylvanian period where the climate was similar to the, Pens the Mississippian, but we had more and more land-based life developing in this time over the landscape. So a lot of these rocks are seen in much of Eastern Ohio, especially in the non-glaciated part. And although it was warm at this time, we had the glaciers at the pole removing water from the ocean and causing the ice to melt at the same time in these cycles, which would cause the sea levels to fluctuate quite a bit. And that would create a lot of swampy conditions, which made the thick coal beds during the Pennsylvanian times. And because land plants flourished at this time in these swampy environments, a lot of oxygen was created from those plants. If you remember that, you know, the plants expel this oxygen and create uh, higher oxygen levels in the atmosphere at this time. As the carbon dioxide is being stored within the organisms and the plants, and then they were falling and creating coal. And we also have other organisms such as uh, the amphibians and the insects that continue to grow as this auction as the oxygen levels were increasing. And a famous location that's well studied in Pe from Pennsylvanian aged rocks is in Linton, Ohio. And this is also by Yellow Quick Creek in Jefferson County, noted by the star here at the edge towards the Pennsylvania border. And it's this old underground coal mine named D Diamond Mine, which is restricted, but here is where a lot of fish and amphibians and reptiles and other organisms were preserved that were all studied for over 100 years. That's how we know a lot about some of the organisms in Ohio at this time. But occasionally these sea retreats became dominant and the land became drier and less coastal, so less sediment was available to accumulate and lithify into rock. So here's a paleogeographic map of the Pennsylvanian time showing the land cycles, terrestrial, which means more land-based times, and the marine times when there's sea or wetter times on the landscape over thousands of years. And if you note during the Pennsylvania, we're still by the equator, but slowly and slowly making it north to touch past and go into where we are today. So that brings us to the Permian, which is the last rocks to be preserved in Ohio during, the, during this Permian time period. So they're not very common, and only represent this small chunk of the southeastern part of Ohio. And also it's because they're not very common because Ohio was very land-based at this time. We didn't have many shallow marine seas. So because we had more land available, there's other animals such as these tetrapods that would evolve. And tetrapods include the amphibians like I talked about before. And tetrapod just means four or tetra and pod meaning foot, four-footed or legged animals. But it also includes an interesting group called the synapsid. And a synapsid, a famous example of a synapsid is the Dimetrodon, which you may be familiar with, and Chris will talk about more. But it is often mistaken for a dinosaur, but it was not, because dinosaurs did not come until later in the geologic record. And these guys kind of look like reptiles, but they might actually be more similar to mammals, interestingly. But Chris will tell you more about that in the next section. And the Permian rocks, like I said, were mostly, it was very dry, less marine seas at this time, and ended with a massive extinction, the biggest one known on Earth, and it killed off a lot of organisms. So why? We don't really have a lot of evidence in this Ohio, but there's many factors, and scientists tend to blame increased volcanism in other parts of the Earth, which caused big ash clouds to spew chemicals and dust all over which resulted in climate and ecosystem changes that the animals had a hard time adapt adapting to so suddenly. So this affected water chemistry, making it very acidic and very tough for a lot of marine animals and plants to continue to thrive. And also, if you remember, the, App the Appalachian Mountains are still forming and the continents are still moving, and that was changing local environments and landscapes, which animals had to continuously adjust. And at this time, the Appalachian Mountains are reaching their maximum heights bigger than the Himalaya, Himalayas today, but erosion was still being dominant. So a lot of these uh, mountains are much smaller than they are today because of all this erosion that was happening. Also, we have this supercontinent known as Pangaea, which was forming. And that was as, as these continents were continuing to collide with each other, 
that would change water current and local climates and the landscape. And this is one of the couple times in Earth's history when all the land fit together like one big irregularly shaped puzzle that the planet kind of forced to fit into each other and eventually that would break up. Oh, sorry, broke apart. And for a bigger picture, here's the global perspective of what the Earth looked like during Ohio's, the end of Ohio's fossil record during the Permian times. As you can see, Ohio is still by just north of the equator. And this is when the Pangea puzzle was nearly complete. So if you remember that there's glaciations I was, a talk, I was talking about that affected global sea levels, they were mostly at the South Pole. So we didn't really have many that we know of in the North Pole. But how do we really know this? There's actually evidence of these ancient glaciers that are still around today over millions and millions of years ago. And these ancient glaciers left the behind debris known as till and caused other little features in the bedrock that we have down here. And that's still preserved today. And all these glacier features are seen on continents that were part of this southern Pangaea, like South America and Africa. And there, since they were once part of the same landmass, they actually had the same ice sheet that overtopped all of them. So it's another puzzle that we can kind of piece together in other parts of the Earth. So what happened after this time? This large extinction after the Permian is not really recorded in Ohio's rocks. And since dinosaurs lived after the Permian and throughout the Mesozoic era, we have over 250 million years of time that is lost. And potential fossils and dinosaurs have been eroded away with time. So there's no rocks that are younger than the Permian in Ohio, thus no dinosaur fossils or anything is found after this time. And there's no evidence for these rocks because either the environment wasn't deposited like you would have in a nice lake or it was deposited, for example, in a lake. But then eventually, as the landscape changed, it was just eroded away with time. However, that is until we have evidence of really interesting fossils from the Ice Age, which is the next webinar during the section of time known as the Pleistocene, such as mammals and mastodons when they roamed the Earth and in Ohio. So join me again next week where I and fellow geologist Andy Nash will talk more about that. But we do have some amazing land-based fossils from Ohio's Carboniferous times that I briefly mentioned that include amphibians, reptiles, and huge plants and insects, and many more. And Chris will get to show you those. So I'll turn it over to Chris now and help any answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, actually, Tyler, before we transition to Chris, um, just one question I wanted to, to ask you is somebody had asked, and this was maybe a little earlier on in the presentation, but what feature gave that tree fossil um, lipodendron? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, <laughs> that scaly feature. So what feature gave that tree fossil that scaly feature, or scaly texture, excuse me? Yeah, the scales. So each of these little itty bits, you know, plants, you know, like trees around today have nice woody bark and that can peel off. But the trees back then, and Chris will kind of show you examples of this, but they actually had these little leaves that would stick out from the tree bark. And these little leaves were kind of weaker than the bark itself. So these leaves were would fall off when the organism would fall over and be preserved. And the little leaflets wouldn't be preserved, but these little divots, these little scars would be left behind where those leaves used to be. And they look like these patterns of in rows of scales. So that's where they kind of get this little this shape, the scale tree from the awesome. lipidodendron fossil. Thanks. I, I just wanted to ask that before we transitioned and got too far. Sure. Uh, so, OK, I'm going to send it to Chris now. Great. All right. Um, can everybody see me now? All right. Well, uh, my name is Chris Wright. I'm a geologist with the uh, Ohio Department of Natural Resources Geological Survey. Uh, my uh, main focus at, at the survey here is that I'm the coal and industrial minerals geologist, and I focus on things like mining geology and paleontology. Uh, for the uh, previous 10 years before I started working here, I was a consulting geologist down in southwestern Virginia, uh, working for uh, doing lots of work for coal mining operations. And during that time, did lots of uh, exploration drilling, and you can see lots of my uh, core samples behind me here uh, from just interesting rocks that we encountered as we were digging, drilling for coal. Uh, did resource estimations on the coal to figure out how much coal there was underground. 
uh, and did lots of work with coal chemical data, as well as going underground into mines and doing mine stability work. And now uh, in my job here at the survey, I get to do some of these same kinds of things, but for the entire state of Ohio. So that's pretty cool. Uh, now I'll uh, get my PowerPoint presentation up here. Uh, let me see here. Do, do, do. All right. All right, so hopefully now everybody sees my uh, presentation here. So now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Ohio's land plants uh, during the Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and Permian time periods. We're going to talk first about the plants and then we'll talk about the animals. So you'll notice from this picture down below uh, that the plants and the forest and swamp area here looks a little different than a uh, typical forest that you might go to if you go to like say Hocking Hills nowadays or anywhere in the forest here in Ohio. Uh, it looks, the trees look a little different. They're a little funny looking and stuff like that. And we'll go over what some of those different trees are and how they, how they came about. So some of the major types of pl uh, plants uh, that were around during this time were uh, cordiites, uh, lycopods, uh, tree ferns, and calamites. And we'll go into more detail about these here in just a minute. But you can see they do look a little different than normal trees do nowadays. Now here's an image of a zoomed out kind of a view of the forest uh, and swamp areas and things like that that used to cover Ohio. Uh, it's very different looking than what you would think of uh, going to a forest today. The trees are very straight and tall, kind of like telephone poles. They don't have trees and, or branches and leaves and things like that all on the lower part of the trees. They just have a bunch of leaves and branches up at the very top of the trees uh, or these weird looking structures at the top of the trees and things like that. They kind of look like something that uh, Dr. Seuss might have imagined or something like that. So very different looking forests and trees during this time period. Uh, on the image on the left here, we've got a nice little uh, rendition of a tree fern. So we had ferns back then, uh, kind of like the ferns that we have nowadays, except we also had a different kind of fern uh, we had things called seed ferns uh, that existed as well. Uh, they look very similar to uh, the tree ferns and ferns that we have nowadays, except that they reproduced with seeds and unfortunately are no longer around. They went extinct around when the dinosaurs went extinct. So, but they look for the most part fairly similar to modern day uh, current ferns that we have. Then we have those things called cordiites. Uh, and those oftentimes have really long leaves and things like that, kind of like what you'd imagine just when you think of a tropical plant. Then you have down at the bottom there, you've got things like calamites, and those things are related to modern day horsetails, uh, which usually live near ponds or swamps and things like that. So we still have things like that today. Now the image over on the right, uh, we have a little, the lycopod kind of growth cycle uh, shown here. So down here uh, in the bottom here on the left, uh, we have, kind of looks like a bunch of roots with uh, a little bit of grass growing up in it. And that's how the lycopod trees start out growing. They have big giant roots and then little tufts of grassy leaves. And then they get bigger as time goes on, as you can see here in the next little part of the image. And then as they continue to grow, they just start growing straight up, uh, kind of like a telephone pole, except they're covered with what looks like grass. And those are actually long little leaves that they have. Uh, that are uh, just growing out of the side of the tree. And like Tyler talked about, uh, they grew on the bark of the trees, not really off of branches. And each time that those little uh, leaves would grow off of the bark, it would leave a little scar in the, uh, in the plant uh, bark. And when the leaf would eventually fall off as the tree grew up, uh, they would uh, be left behind as a little scar, like a little diamond shaped pattern oftentimes. And then the last part of the image over here on the right, You'll see the tree just continues growing straight up, uh, nice and tall. And then finally it starts growing some uh, branches and leaves and things like that uh, when it reaches full maturity, as well as starting to grow some little uh, spore cones uh, where it releases spores for reproduction. Because uh, these plants didn't have seeds like modern day uh, uh, trees and plants like that. And also you can kind of see in the bottom here, there's a little seven foot tall basketball player for scale. So these trees were very tall, even though this was a very long time ago. Uh, there are some estimates I've seen that show that these kind of trees would grow up to 90 feet tall in just a 10 year period. So they grew very, very quickly and they grew straight up. So it's still, it's very interesting and different kind of in trees than what we have today. 
Now here's a little bit of a zoomed in image of some of those lycopod uh, like trees. So over on the left here, we've got some of that diamond shaped pattern of the, the bark of the lepidodendron tree um, that we have here. And then over up here in the upper right, we have the bark pattern of a different kind of tree. One of the, one of the ones that looks a little funny, like it's got weird little leaves and things like that growing at the top called sigillaria. And that bark is different than the lycopod, uh, the lepidodendron uh, type of bark, because it kind of grew vertical little straight lines up. And each of those little round holes that you see is where the leaf would attach. And when they grew, the leaf would eventually fall off and then you'd have the little leaf scar, kind of like the diamond shape pattern. And in the middle up here at the top, uh, we have what looks like what's a, a rendition of a recreation of the little branches that were up at the top of the trees. And they may look kind of familiar to you. They look very similar to how uh, pine trees and things like that uh, look. And uh, just kind of interesting, and you can kind of see, imagine how these little leaves, they look like needles, but they're actually leaves, would just fall out and leave a little scar behind. Now, it wasn't just the bark and the branches that had these cool patterns on them of these plants. Also, their roots were really cool too. Uh, they had uh, little holes all in them. Uh, and they're called stigmaria. And each of those little holes would have a little root tendril growing off into the sediment and soil and things like that to bring up nutrients to the plant. So it was a very different kind of uh, kind of plants than what we had today. And as you can see from this chart here, it shows that they did grow very tall. And this is uh, just some artist recreations of what some of that of those trees might have looked like. You have the diamond shaped pattern of the bark, some of those different little, uh, they look like hairy little grassy trees and things like that. So just all sorts of different kinds of looks to them. Next, we have things like ferns. And uh, like we already talked about, there were two different kinds of ferns, the, the tree ferns and the seed ferns, and then little uh, ferns that would grow on the ground like what we have today. They look very similar to modern day ferns if you've ever been out in the woods and run across them, uh, very similar. And in this middle image, you can actually see some fossilized uh, seeds of some of those ferns, except some of these ferns would get very big and be tree-like as well. So it's also, again, pretty cool. Here's some artist renditions <clears throat> of what those uh, tree ferns might have looked like. You can see uh, them circled in red here. Uh, so very different looking kind of trees than what we have nowadays. Uh, look kind of like palm trees a little bit uh, in some ways. Next uh, type of plant we have here is a, a plant called Calamites, uh, which is related to modern day horsetails. So we do still have some relatives of these kinds of plants around today. Um, the bottom image here, you can see uh, that for the most part, the plants kind of look very similar to like a bamboo. Uh, if you've ever seen bamboo, it's kind of got little segments uh, going up it, uh, horizontal little segments. And you can kind of see that going along here, along the, uh, the bark of the plant. And what's interesting about these little segments is as they would grow, they would get these little row of leaves that would grow around in a circle around the plant. And you can see that up in the image above and the image over on the, the far left. Uh, you can see all the various leaves and things like that. And sometimes those would get preserved, attached to the, the main trunk of the, the tree or the stem of the plant. And when you find those, those are called a uh, fossil called annularia. So also really cool and interesting. And it's cool that we still have some of those around today. And here's some artist renditions of what uh, some of those might have looked like in the swamps and forests and things like that. So here's the type that live uh, more along the water and things like that that are low, kind of like the ones we have nowadays. But you also have these gigantic tree-like forms as well that could grow. So also really cool and interesting. Then we had the next type of plants we'll talk about are a type called gymnosperms. Uh, we break those up into two different groups during this time period. We have uh, cordiites and conifers. Conifers may sound familiar. Uh, that's pine trees, basically. Uh, and we still have conifers and pine trees and things like that around today. And they didn't really need to live around the water, the cordiites and the conifers. They were more land-based, so they could uh, move away from the swampy environments and things like that a little bit this time, which was a new feature for these plants, because most of the plants needed water to reproduce and to, uh, to be in nice, really wet environments. But these guys could handle a little bit of drier environments. And they have little needles and things like that on the conifers, uh, just like we do today. And the, the cordiites, though, their kind of big thing was that they had these big uh, long leaves like tropical kind of plants would have. So you can kind of see some of those various fossil uh, leaf patterns and things like that. 
And in this image, our rendition, you can see some of those kind of tropical uh, cordiites and things like that. Uh, and they had the tree form would kind of look more like a mangrove kind of swamp like what we have down in the Everglades. So that's pretty cool too. Now, as Tyler talked about earlier, he talked about coal and how it forms from all these plants and trees like that growing in the swamps. They fall down on top of each other, just build up over time. And eventually we have coal that forms from them. And to form coal, it takes about 10 feet of plant material to build up. And then when it, uh, it's, it's called peat at that time. And then eventually there's lots of heat and pressure from rocks being piled up on top of it, which forces the water to come out of the, the material and as well as compresses it. And eventually you get down to being coal. And for every 10 feet of plant material you have, that's about how, that's about how much plant material it takes to make one foot of coal. So uh, it's made up of all these different layers and things like that, like you can see in this little picture of a coal, you can see some of the different layers that we have in the coal. And down here in the bottom, we have coal mine pictures. Uh, and those are uh, taken uh, from Ohio here. Uh, some of the various mines we have, uh, where we have thick accumulations of coal that are thick enough to be mined. And like I just said a minute ago, for every 10 feet of plant material to equal one foot of coal, but you can see here that this is about seven or more feet of coal uh, here. So that would mean there would have been about 70 feet of plant material that had to build up to make that coal. So it takes a lot of plants that were growing and not decaying to be able to build up all these thick coal seams. Then on the image on the right, you can see the continuous miner machine as it's uh, digging into the coal and stuff like that. Now, like Tyler also mentioned, we don't really find plant fossils often in coal because of all that compression and things like that that happened. A lot of the fossils are unfortunately destroyed, but sometimes you can find plant fossils in the roof of the coal mine. So if you look up when you're in a coal mine, you can sometimes find different plant fossils like the one up in the upper right of the image. You can see this, this is that, uh, the root of the lepidodendron tree uh, called stigmaria, and it's got all those little root tendrils kind of growing off of it. And then you've got different uh, leaf patterns and things like that that are uh, found in the roofs and things like that. Now, the only bad thing about finding plant fossils in the roof of the coal mine is that unfortunately they can, they're fairly weak uh, with the rock is being heavier underneath them. So sometimes they'll fall out of the roof and can fall on top of people and hurt them if they're underground. So you gotta watch out for fossils, even though they're really cool. Another really cool thing you can find in coal mines sometimes uh, for plant fossils are uh, fossilized tree stumps called kettle bottoms. And what, how those form is that these trees, when they grew, they weren't like normal trees that we think of today. We think of them, you know, you cut a tree down, it's really hard all the way through. You can count the little tree rings and all the layers and things like that. Oftentimes these trees had very hard, strong bark, but the inside of the, of the tree was very soft and pulpy. And when the tree died, um, oftentimes the, the material on the inside of the tree would deteriorate and fall apart, leaving just uh, the, the bark uh, around it as like a hollow log or a hollow stump. And uh, then sometimes a river nearby would flood, bring in some mud and things like that that would then fill in that stump. And then uh, with mud, leaving a cast of the impression of the inside of the tree. But it'd be having a little ring of that coal uh, from the bark uh, around the edge. Now these are bad in coal mines because when you mine out the coal underneath them, they're not supported anymore and they're full of all that heavy shale uh, inside of them so they can just fall right out because that coal rim around the edge isn't very strong. So it can just fall right down on, on top of the miners when they're underground. So you have to watch out for that sort of thing when you see them underground. Uh, that's why they often put these little roof bolts and things like that to try to help keep them up into the roof to protect the miners. Now, during these times, uh, the Carboniferous environment you can see on the left versus the Permian environment on the right, uh, things were very swampy and wet and lots of trees and forests and things like that in the Carboniferous. But as the Permian started to happen, like Tyler talked about, the environment started to change a little bit. It was a lot less wet, it was drier, uh, and climate was changing and things like that. So plants and animals had to evolve uh, over time to try to suit the environments. And we uh, know about that from biostratigraphy. If you remember the first webinar talk we did, there was a nice explanation about uh, biostratigraphy and how that works and how geologists use that. Because plants, uh, animal, and animals uh, species evolve and change over time and go extinct over time and things like that. 
So looking at this chart, we can look and see that different plants live at different times. Sometimes they span long periods of times. Sometimes they're just short periods of times. So if we find those plant fossils, then we can age date some of these rocks and figure out exactly what age the rock is uh, based on the plant fossils. Plant fossils are sometimes hard to find, but these trees were giving off millions and millions of pollen spores every year. So we sometimes look for the fossilized pollen spores because they're all throughout the rocks of this time period. And uh, they're called palenomorphs when they're uh, fossilized pollen spores. And we can use those to try to date some of these rocks of these different times. To do that though, these things are very microscopic and small. So we need to break up the coal, put the little bits of uh, the fossils and plants on the thin sections and look at them under big microscopes. And then we'll be able to see these cool little uh, uh, fossil pollen spores, palanomorphs. And here's some uh, examples of some of those fossil pollen spores. So over on the left, we've got some of the lycopod type trees and things like that with all the really cool little forms. But again, these are very, very small. And on the right, we have all these kinds of ferns and things like that, the different uh, uh, spores that came off of them. And then we've got these guys, uh, some of the other plants we've talked about with their fossil pollen spores. These ones were a little bit bigger uh, and I'm, they're a little bit more boring also. But uh, I always think of the one in the middle kind of looks like a potato chip to me. And uh, now we'll switch gears and talk about land animals uh, or animals that were living on the land during these times as opposed to the plants because we also had animals during this time. But first we'll start off in the water. But we're not in the oceans anymore even though occasionally Ohio uh, was covered in oceans like Tyler talked about. Uh, with this time I'm talking about more things like lakes and streams and rivers and swamps and things like that. So we had freshwater fish that were around during those times. So we had things like normal bony fish up here on the upper left area, just normal looking fish. We had things like lung fish uh, down on the bottom left here that were able to uh, crawl out on land and breathe a little bit of air to go from one pond to another if they needed to. And we had things like on the right, we have different versions of modern day coelacanth at the bottom. Uh, it's a type of fish. Currently they live in the ocean, but we used to have fossil forms that lived in freshwater as well, as well as the ocean. And up on the top, you can kind of see what the bones and fossils would look like of those creatures as well. But we have fossils of those from that Linton fossil uh, site that uh, Tyler mentioned earlier uh, from Ohio. So lots of different kinds of fish. But there weren't just fish that were in the ocean, in the lakes and streams and swamps and things like that, swimming in the water. We also had freshwater sharks. Uh, so everybody always thinks, oh, sharks only live in the ocean. Not during this time, though. Sharks were also in the uh, in the freshwater, in the swamps and things like that. They didn't really look exactly like normal sharks, but you can see on the bottom picture, they were quite large compared to a human. Uh, but they also had these weird little features. Instead of a dorsal fin, they had a very large little spike on their back of their head. Uh, and we're not really sure exactly what those are for. It may have been like a, a ray has for protection. They could have some kind of venom maybe or something like that. You can't really attack them from the top if they've got that little uh, spear of uh, uh, on their back of their neck or anything like that. But they did have uh, normal looking shark teeth and things like that, very sharp and wouldn't want to go swimming during this time period. Now back on the land, they had also, we also had things like bugs, uh, things like that like we have nowadays. We had Things like cockroaches, spiders, millipedes, long-legged wing bugs, kind of like flies and things like that. They were all around during these time periods as well. Uh, and this is when they really took off uh, different kinds of arthropods. Uh, but as Tyler talked about earlier, uh, there was lots of oxygen in the atmosphere during this time because of all the trees and forests. So when you have lots of oxygen in the atmosphere, things can grow really big. So we had really big bugs as well. We had giant dragonflies like uh, Meganuera here, uh, which got to be up to two foot wingspan. So pretty big uh, dragonflies, you know, the size of uh, medium sized birds. So that's pretty crazy to think about dragonflies that are that big. Then we also had giant millipedes. You know, you might uh, roll over a, a rock or a log or something like that and find little millipedes uh, that are an inch long or something like that. Well, we had millipedes back during this time that were over six feet long. So huge bugs and that were roaming around. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be around during those times and run into one of those. We also had things like amphibians. And here's some pictures of some modern day amphibians. 
uh, things like frogs and salamanders and things like that. You'll notice with the pictures of the amphibians that their skin is very wet looking. And um, that's because they need uh, to stay around moisture like water sources, uh, lakes, rivers, streams, swamps uh, to keep themselves wet. Otherwise, they'll dry out uh, and not be able to live. They also use water for reproduction like frogs laying little eggs in the water that eventually become tadpoles and things like that. So they relied on water, so they couldn't really go inland very far. They just had to mostly stay near the water sources during that time. Uh, but we also, like I said, did have them during that time period. We just had funny looking ones uh, like this guy here, uh, Diplocalus, uh, with its like boomerang like shaped head. And then we had things like uh, platy rhinops over here on the right, which looks kind of like a modern day frog skeleton. So all sorts of different forms that were around during those times, which are uh, still around uh, for the most part, similar type creatures. But we also had giant ones too. Like I said, lots of oxygen during that time. It wasn't just the bugs that got big. We had giant amphibians too. Uh, so we had giant uh, amphibians the size of crocodiles and alligators and things like that. Uh, except remember, they had to stay close to the water, otherwise their skin would dry out. So you wouldn't see them uh, laying on the shore or anything like that very often. Uh, trying to, like an alligator, trying to soak up the sun or anything like that. They mostly want to stay in that water. So definitely not a good time to be in the water during these time periods. But when these guys did happen to crawl out of, onto the land or just in the soft mud, just in the shallow water, they would sometimes leave behind their footprints, which is pretty cool. So we find fossil footprints of them sometimes, uh, and we can learn about how they moved and things like that. Uh, based on those footprints, just like we do with dinosaur footprints uh, nowadays as well. Now we'll talk a little bit about tetrapod early evolution. Uh, as Tyler mentioned, tetrapod means four-legged creatures. And uh, during the Devonian, uh, way over here at the left, we had the first tetrapods starting to form. And those were when fish and things like that, like our coelacanth that we talked about, were able to start crawling out and the lungfish start crawling out onto the land and eventually evolved into amphibians. Now, it took a long time, but during the Carboniferous, eventually there was a split that happened uh, in the amphibians, and a new type of creature was formed called amniotes. And amniotes are important because they're, for the first time, they're able to create little like scales and things like that on their skin so they don't dry out like amphibians, so they could go away from the water. <clears throat> uh, they wouldn't have to keep their skin wet or anything like that. But also importantly, they were able to first form eggshells as well. So they could lay their eggs not in the water anymore. They could lay them on land and have them protected and not dry out. Uh, so then shortly after they split off as amniotes, uh, there was different uh, divisions that in evolution that happened uh, during these time periods. Uh, we had a break off called the anapsids, which are things like today's turtles. Then we had diapsids, which are things like today's lizards, crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds. And then we also had synapsids, which are related to things like today's mammals, like you and me. Now, a little bit more about the anapsids, synapsids, and diapsids. Uh, uh, a lot of their skulls, uh, what makes them into the different categories is based on the jaw muscle attachments that they have on their skull. So, and, that, and that's represented on the skulls by how many holes they have in their head that are not related to their nose or their eyes. Uh, so you can see this top guy, the anapsids, are related to things like today's turtles, and they don't have any other openings except for the nostril and the eye socket. Whereas synapsids, like mammals and, th and us, have a, only have one extra opening aside from the eye socket or the nose. And these uh, openings are called temporal fenestra. And diapsids, like reptiles and birds, they have two openings in the back of their skull for uh, their muscle attachments. And that makes sense if you think about it for uh, dinosaurs and birds and things like that, because they had to have really strong jaws to break open like birds with seeds and things like that, or dinosaurs for eating lots of uh, big animals and attacking big animals and things like that. So they had to have really strong jaws. And to do that, you have to have lots of muscle attachments on your skull. Uh, so that's why uh, those three different groups broke apart. Like I said, early we have reptiles during this time. We have early reptile evolution. Uh, we've got, uh, looks like a guy on the bottom, looks like a normal everyday kind of lizard. Uh, so they have scales and things like that. Uh, we've also found some cool fossils of some of these kinds of creatures that are living inside some of those hollow logs that I was talking about earlier. So that form the kettle bottom. 
Uh, sometimes you would have the hollow log and uh, before the mud filled it in, an a animal like these reptiles have been found living inside some of these uh, 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 tree stumps, uh, kind of like a den or something like that uh, for protection. And we found them fossilized. So that's also really cool that we found them fossilized inside the tree stumps. And then as time uh, went on and uh, more creatures evolved, uh, there were lots of different uh, large uh, tetrapods, uh, various kinds of uh, mammals, uh, mammal-like creatures, and uh, uh, various uh, amphibians and reptiles and things like that. And over here on the left, you can see the outline of a human just for scale. So you can see some of these creatures got very large, even though this was a very long time ago and early in their evolution. Now we'll talk about two of my favorites of these kind of creatures. So we've got over here on the upper left, we've got Dimetrodon and Adaphosaurus down on the bottom right. And they look like dinosaurs, but they're not dinosaurs. They're synapsids, and as we just learned, synapsids means they have one opening in their skull like mammals. And these guys are probably kind of a transition between reptile-like creatures and mammals, so sometimes we call them mammal-like reptiles. Uh, so that's also really interesting. Um, what's also cool is they got pretty big, as you can see in the upper right image. There's a person for scale, and then you can see some of these guys got pretty big. Uh, but you'll notice the biggest feature of these guys is these huge sails they have on their back. And we're not really sure exactly what uh, the purpose of those sails were. We've got a couple different ideas about what they could uh, be for. Uh, they could have been, uh, since these creatures were probably cold-blooded, they could have been using them like giant solar panels to try to heat themselves up in the morning sun, uh, just kind of turn their back toward the sun there and let the sun warm them up uh, a lot quicker. Or they could have been for protection, uh, for because you can't attack something that's got a big giant uh, a fin on its back. Uh, or it could have been for trying to blend into its environment in the forest or, you know, with camouflage or something like that, or for mating displays or things like that. Uh, so uh, we're not really sure, but uh, there's all sorts of different ideas about what they could be for. So, but they're pretty cool. And that's all I've got for the uh, PowerPoint part of the presentation now. Um, now I will... Uh, Stop sharing that, and I will show you some of the fossils that I have here uh, in the office with me. Uh, hey, so, we'll, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, somebody had asked, are there different types of coals? And I, I think you might touch on that, but I just wanted to put that question out there. Sure. Uh, uh, there are different types of coals. Uh, in Ohio, though, we only uh, primarily have uh, just uh, normal uh, everyday coal, uh, bituminous coal is what it's called. Uh, there's different grades of coal depending on how much heat and pressure have been applied to the rocks over time. So you have lignite is the earliest form of coal after it's uh, from the plant material. Then we have peat. And then as it gets compressed more, it turns into lignite. And then as it turns, uh, gets compressed even more, it turns into bituminous coal. And then if it gets really compressed and heated up, then it becomes anthracite. And unfortunately, we don't have any anthracite here in Ohio. Uh, there is some in Pennsylvania and the really uh, folded up rocks and things like that in eastern uh, Pennsylvania, but none of that here. And lignite, unfortunately, we don't have any of that as well uh, for the most part in Ohio. Uh, if there is any, it's uh, related to the most recent glaciations that Tyler will talk about next week. So, but any um, other real quick? Yeah, so you had touched on a giant dragonfly and giant millipede. Yeah. Um, so are there maybe cousins or relatives of those species that exist today? Are those the common, you know, millipedes and dragonflies out there in our world or? Yeah, they're, they're probably all related uh, in some way, very distantly, obviously, because it's a very long time ago, but they're very uh, much uh, related. Like, you know, here's a little uh, figure I've got of a dragonfly and they look very similar in the fossils that we find as well, except, you know, they're 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 two feet big so they're quite quite large compared to a person so uh you know uh, just a lot bigger and the millipedes were a lot bigger the millipedes we're not really sure exactly but they may have also had uh, some kind of venom to try to like uh, capture prey and things like that because uh, some modern day millipedes and centipedes have venom as well but we're not really sure so but yeah awesome um, so are there some fossils or rocks behind you that uh, maybe you could hold up and, and yeah. show the group? Yep. 
so here I've got, we'll start back at the beginning of our presentation when we talked about uh, some of the trees and things like that. So here I've got a fossil of some of that le, uh, lepidodendron uh, bark, the scale bark and stuff like that. Hopefully you guys can see the little uh, diamond shaped kind of patterns and things like that that form their bark. And each of these little things had the little leaf growing off of it that eventually fell off as the tree grew up um, and matured. And then we have fossils of the, uh, the, the root. So this is that stigmaria. So you can see all the little tiny holes in it is where all the little root tendrils were uh, that were growing out into the sediment and soil and things like that. So uh, it's pretty cool. Then we uh, next talked about ferns and things like that. So we've got fossil ferns, uh, look like modern day ferns for the most part. I've got a couple examples of those. So, and they, they can be very interesting with their detail sometimes. So pretty cool. And sometimes you can find a whole bunch of them compressed together uh, like this one here, where you can see a whole bunch of little ferns all on the same rock. And uh, you can even sometimes if you want, you can buy little toy tree, fossil or replica trees. So here's a little replica of one of those uh, tree ferns and things like that, what it would have uh, could have looked like and things like that. So you can buy all sorts of little toys of things. And then you have things like the calamites. So here's the, the calamites uh, with all the little uh, horizontal little lines on it that would have originally had little uh, rows of leaves going around in a circle around the plant. Uh, so like modern related to modern day horsetails. <coughs> Then we have, like I said, my my little favorite guy here, the dragonfly. Uh, so they got two feet, two feet large, uh, you know, wingspan. So really big uh, kind of guys. Little toys of like the little coelacanth with its uh, various fins. So it's got uh, the two front fins and the two back fins and things like that. So these kind of were some of the first creatures that were able to crawl out onto the land and explore uh, during those early Devonian or the Devonian times. Uh, and eventually evolved into amphibians and, and everything else. And then we've got, uh, so here's a little, uh, that platy rhinops, that picture I had. Here's a little replica of one of the fossils of one of those. So you can see how big it was. So it's kind of similar size to a frog, uh, but still pretty cool that uh, we can find some fossils of those. And here's a little replica, I think of a little reptile. So here's its skull and kind of its body going off that way. So all sorts of different kinds of cool fossils you can find. Hey, Chris, then, where can you yeah. find the um, little toys or repl replicas at? Uh, I found them online, uh, just various sources. If you just type in like uh, on Google, just uh, type in like toy Dimetrodon, toy Coelacanth or, or something like that. That's usually what I do. Oftentimes you find lots of little dinosaur toys and you have to dig to try to find some of these things like the little fern and stuff like that. It's hard to find. No those. pun intended. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then we also have things like Dimetrodon, like I said, one of my favorite guys, the, the mammal-like reptile. So he's pretty cool. But you can also find cool things like little plush toys of them as well. Uh, so, so that's pretty cool. These are sold by the Museum of the Earth up in Ithaca, New York. Uh, little Paleozoic Pals is what they call them. And then, uh, like I was saying, we you know, the Daphosaurus and the uh, Dimetrodon, they have spines and things like that in their backbones. Well, sometimes we find those uh, fossils of those spines, uh, and here's some little fragments of some of those uh, various uh, spine fragments and things that we found uh, over time. So uh, pretty cool, but it's hard to find a, a nice whole complete one or anything like that. Usually it's just small fragments like that that we find. Um, but Another little thing uh, that you can do at home, a little fun activity if you want to kind of make your own kind of uh, fake plant fossil or something like that, uh, is you can go get some uh, some Play-Doh or some, uh, there's online lots of recipes for no-bake clays and things like that. And you can make that. And I've got some here. So here's some, some homemade uh, no-bake clay and you just kind of squish it up or some Play-Doh. And then you go out to your yard and get a leaf of a tree like this. And I put it on a little board here so you can see them or put them on a table. And then you can take it, your lump of Play-Doh and just kind of press it into the leaf like that and then peel it off slowly, maybe. 
doesn't want to come off easily. <laughs> Hold on, let me try this again. It's sticking too much. All right. Do, 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 do. Try this one. There we go. That worked better. And then you can get a little impression of the leaf uh, and, and things like that. So this is a little too wet to work with today. But uh, if you get some Play-Doh or something like that, you can do this or get some mud. Uh, you can do this sort of fun activity. And if you want, you can even, uh, if they're the no-bake clay, or if they are the bakeable kind of clay, you can uh, bake and make your own little kind of plant fossil. So if you can find a fern in your yard or something like that, or, uh, or a leaf from a, a tree in your yard, you can then make your own little uh, fossil leaf fragment kind of thing. And that's, it shows you kind of how, exactly how these fossils uh, sometimes formed. Uh, is just from impressions of the leaves before they uh, dissolved away and things like that. But that's about all I have, unless there are any more questions. Um, I think this is a, a good time to wrap it up because we're about at the the time limit here. Um, okay. Unless uh, unless you have anything else to add or Tyler, do you have anything else to add before we head out here? No, I don't think so. OK, um, so I just wanted to quickly, I guess I'll um, put myself in the in the hot seat here. Um, I just wanted to quickly tell everyone that, well, first of all, thanks for joining us and we hope to see you next week. As I mentioned earlier, um, next, week, next week we're going to talk about fossils of Ohio's Ice Age. And then the week after that, which is our last of the series, is going to be how to fossil hunt in Ohio. But if you're interested in awesome animal adaptations, our Division of Wildlife is also doing a webinar series um, that takes place at 10 o'clock on Wednesdays, so tomorrow. And um, they talk about all different types of adaptations in, in different ecosystems. So tomorrow we're talking about wetlands wildlife's, um, wildlife and their adaptations. Um, if you have pictures of rocks or fossils and want to share them with us, um, please put them on social media and, and tag us. Uh, the uh, Division of Geological Survey has their own web, um, Facebook page now, so tag them and hashtag Ohio Rock Talks. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, Tyler and Chris. Thank you.